Okay, welcome to today's podcast. How to go from zero to a million. What's the psychology? What's the mindset? I'm going to be giving you specific examples. I got James Swanick here, business partner of mine, friend, and I got Kate here. She's giving away stuff, iPhones and cash, and we had all kinds of internet issues. So let me, if you're writing this down, I'm going to get right to the point. Um, if you want to go rags to riches or if you already got some money, but you want to increase specifically around money, number one thing you got to write down is proactivity. How proactive are you? Now, the opposite of proactivity is robot automatons. And this whole damn world is full of robot automatons. If you know what an, who knows what, an, do you know what an automaton is, James? Kate? No, I do not. Just a robot. Google it. Run. Google what an automaton. Kate's going to Google what it does, the, what it's told, and that's it. Yeah, but an automaton was a specific word. Oh, I'm on. Um, you can go off airplane mode. Okay. So, as Kate looks it up, I can explain her. She can when she gets to the Wikipedia page. Automatons are basically machines that just kind of you twist them. And self-operating machine, a yeah. machine of, or control mechanism designed to automatically follow Super a close predetermined to your mouth. sequence of operations. Even closer to the oh. mic. Oh, okay. you should, your chin should touch the mic is the best way to do it. Right under Can it. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay. And talk loud because the live people can't hear you. Automaton, what is it? It is a self-operating machine or machine controlled mechanism. Or control mechanism designed to automatically follow a predetermined sequence of operations. Yes. So just understand this. I'm not joking when I say most humans are automatons. So humans, sometimes I say humans are robots, but they're not really robots. Like James was talking about somebody who was working for him that he had to let go because they were, mm, what's the word you would use? Not proactive, <laughs> dumb, <laughs> annoying. Say it. It's politically incorrect. So annoying as hell. It. Yeah, just didn't, wasn't proactive. Yeah, yeah. just did, did what he was told, but did that poorly a lot of times. And then when there are obvious things to get fixed, he didn't do it. He was like right. waiting for permission. Right. Instead of just doing it. Yeah. There's something clear. But see, wrong. he was a human in that he had the neocortex part of the brain. There was the ability to think things through. So the psychology of going from zero to hundred, uh, zero to a million assumes you're a human. Like if you are a single cell organism, a slug, or my German shepherds, you don't have a chance to go from zero to a million because you don't have a prefrontal cortex, the part above your brain, right above your eyes. Okay, right above your eyes here, this part of your brain. If if you get hurt right here in the front of your brain, you're gonna be revert. Cool. Yeah, well, you also revert to like an animal state. There's a famous guy. His name was. Phineas something in I forget his last name in the 1800s and he was working on a construction site or something and a nail went right into his head and it deactivated one part of his brain but he still was like a regular human but he lost I think emotional he became like Asperger's like autistic hmm. just for because there's a part of your brain that controls social functions so as we talk about the steps for you to go from zero to one million the first step is to increase in your proactivity and all the people around you's proactivity. So if you're trying to build a million dollar business or just become more successful and you're surrounded by people that are basically like wind up dolls, you wind them up every Monday and then you hope by Friday they're still productive, but you know if you're not there winding them up again, that's what an automaton is. You automaton, you get a, it, it, you ever seen those little balls? You go chick and they go click. Click mm -hmm. back and forth like that. Mm. That's like an automaton. Do you think there's ever a place where an automaton would be beneficial? Yes. An automaton is good for very, very, very menial manual labor. Like when a I lived factory. on a... Yeah, a, like factory, a factory. A factory. Or when I lived on a farm, we had to dig post holes. So you would make a fence that's one mile long and you'd literally have to just dig... Dig, dig. And it was, I, I almost went out of my mind. And, but what allows you to dig holes for a living is not the same thing that's going to allow you to rise up to financial success. Because let's think about, so number one, increase the in productivity. 
Number two, and, and I used to call that in my 67 steps, I call that the worth a damn factor. So worth a damn factor to me, awareness is one of the things, which is a precursor of, of um, proactivity. Because what proactivity means this, and this is what I recommend. Some of you who own businesses or want an assistant, just do this. This is a free advice that will change your life. Hire, let's say you want an assistant for your business or your job, whether you're an entrepreneur or work for somebody else. Hire three at on Monday and say, listen, I'm gonna st- I want to hire you all for one week and I probably can only keep one of you, but I need some extra help this week and then I'll keep one of you, you know, on long term if it works out. Then the first day, if you're married or have a boyfriend or girlfriend, give them this one assignment to do, but don't say anything about it. Just say, hey, I want to take my girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife out to dinner tonight. Will you make a reservation for six o'clock? Okay, now that's it. Then walk out of the room and give three of them, like put them, the three people separate so they don't work together. You want to see who works correct, who works on their own. So you got these three. Now what you're looking for, because this is what's going to happen out of three people, all three of them, humans are smart enough, they'll make you a reservation. So want to make a reservation at a sushi place, want to make a reservation at a Mexican place, want to make a reservation at Italian food. Now, you go back the next day and you ask them why they made that reservation. And what you're looking for is this basic answer. One of them goes, well, I knew you were married. I knew your last, your name is Ty Lopez or James Swanick. And so I went to your Facebook and I looked to see if you're in a relationship and it said, James is in a relationship married. So I clicked the link over to your wife's Instagram or a Facebook. Then I scrolled through and I noticed she always posts food pictures of Italian food. So I then went to Yelp and I picked the very best Italian place. And I knew, I asked you where you lived. You live in Brentwood. And I put within five miles of Brentwood. Then you ask them, okay, that's great. You were proactive. You actually looked deeper than the average person would look. You didn't just make a reservation at a restaurant you liked. You knew, you figured out my wife, my, my wife's, you know, favorite dish. And then you say, which of you called at 545 when I was driving there to make sure everything was okay and, and the reservation had been put in correctly? Now, odds are you won't find any of the three that did all of that. But you can basically find the person who did the closest to that. And the closest to that is the person that you keep as your assistant. That's the most proactive one. That's the most proactive, the most aware, the most worth a damn. And I, you know, Warren Buffett is now the second richest man in the world. And this is the point number two. So point number one is be proactive, be worth a damn, and surround yourself with people who are proactive and worth a damn. Number two is remember that making money isn't hard, okay? I was talking earlier, I launched a new program that's like a new version of the 67 Steps, and um, it's called the Inner Circle. And basically, right now in your world, the world that you live in, there is a complete inner circle, a secret society, right outside your doorstep, within 20 miles of where you live, I promise you. And while you're struggling financially, and why life sucks and you're not happy and you don't like your job and all this, these people are making a million dollars a day in the same economy that you live in, right? The same world, same economy. Some of them will have grown up poor. They didn't all inherit their money. So you got to ask yourself, why? Why? And I'll tell you why. Because as Bill Gates said, the richest man in the world... He says he only uses about 10% of his brain on business. He said business has never been hard. It's not that hard. So number two point is that making money is not hard. And I'm going to tell you why. There's a reason. Why do you think making money is not hard, Kate? Give your opinion. James. Um, Well... Making Let money. James go first. We'll put James on the spot. I would just say because there's, there's always problems in the world and business is solving the problem for yourself and then solving it for someone else and then solving it for a hundred people, a million people and you can scale. So 
there's always problems that need to be solved. As long as you can solve those problems, then you can make money doing it. Okay. I will. Ex- I think that's a good answer. Kate, do you have anything to add? Why would it be specifically easy to go from zero to a million dollars? Somebody says, this guy, Verbana, said because money is everywhere. Yeah, because... Go ahead. <laughs> um... I don't know. <laughs> Kate is shy. <laughs> what were you going to say? Nothing. Just go back to James. <laughs> <laughs> when you put non-business people on there. the spot, it's tough with business. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you my opinion. The reason it's easy and what Bill Gates meant is that, well, actually, this is what Charlie Munger said. If it wasn't for the stupidity of the world, we wouldn't be so rich. So here's why. The odds of your competition being more proactive than you are so infinitesimally low that you can almost always compete even if you're not a genius. Literally. I mean, I can't think of one industry where I meet the people. Maybe Elon Musk or something with like Tesla or something. But remember, Elon Musk didn't design the cars. He has engineers like no one person, you think Bill Gates was smart enough to build, he had a hundred, Bill Gates had a hundred thousand employees. Uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have 200,000 employees. So I think that the reason is it's a contrast bias. If you're proactive and worth a damn, all of a sudden no one else is, especially around business. Because one of the things I was saying about the inner circle, basically the world there's a handful of people in the in this inner world, inner circle, that teach their kids all this stuff. And you and I grew up, what did we grow up? Making money is hard. Becoming a millionaire is rare. Making a million bucks is rare. It's going to be hard. It's going to be recessions. The economy won't allow it. It's luck. It's not luck if you do it more than once. My grandpa used to say, once is luck, twice is skill. And there's a great book on this by a guy... It's called, there's several books. One's called Good to Great. Great by Choice, I think, is another Jim one. Jim Collins? Yeah, Jim Collins, very respected business, one of the top business. And he said he wondered if it was luck. So he went around and studied all these people who had gone from zero to a million or zero to a billion. And he said they do it over and over again. So if you're throwing darts at a dartboard and you hit the center once, that's luck. You could just have beginner's luck. But if you hit it two, three, four, five, six, seven times, and when you look at people that are go from zero to a million, a lot of them, there are some that are lucky and it's just a one-hit wonder. But in my experience, it's because they have a different psychology. And just promise you this. If you think something is hard... It'll be hard. It will be hard. You think something's easy, it'll be easy. Exactly. If you go, all right, I'm overweight, I'm 300 pounds overweight, biggest obstacle of my life is yeah. going to be to get in shape, you have created a self-fulfilling prophecy. Life is whatever you say it is. Yeah. For example, if you say, life is a party, woohoo, right. do you see how my physiology just changed? Yeah. Right? I put my hands in the air and I, my voice yep. w- was of a, a higher level and I was dancing around with a big smile on my face. Yep. It's hard to say life is a party without doing that. Like try right. saying it with a like a sad. Yeah, life is an amazing life party. Life yeah. is a party. Like it's hard, right? So life is whatever you say. If you say, "Oh man, this is hard. Life is hard," then life's going to be hard. If you say this is easy, or if you say life is a gift, oh, life is a gift, then you'll see everything around you as a gift. Yeah, it's exactly what you say it is. Yeah, and if and you think think about this. Um, we're programmed by society one way or another we're programmed by society right so what is society pounding into everybody's head well right now if you look on twitter news you look on wherever you get your news source it's basically that the world is ending it's 50 percent about donald trump and some political thing it's uh, another 30 percent is about statues right now um another 20 percent is about kim jong-un and nuclear and i'm not saying any of that's not newsworthy because some of that is newsworthy it's histrionics 
Yeah, histrionics. Exactly. That's Hist exactly what it is. Histrionics is basically people shouting and whining and complaining. But it has no relevance to what actually alters your life. Because what alters your life and what makes it good or bad, life is mostly a social problem. So most of the things that make your life good is who are the, per who are the people you spend eight hours a day with? Is it a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend that you that is an idiot or that annoys you? Is it your boss is too hard to deal with? Business partner who's Machiavellian and not trustworthy? That's all that for the most part, by the way. My experience is business is easy. Harder is people. Every <laughs> bad true, thing yeah. in my life, every struggle that I have, yeah. money is, is not the freaking hard part in life, man. The hard part is people. Because people are devious. People are exploitative. People want more than, they want to take more than they give. So number two, as I said, the mindset you go into this, like James said, just go into a great movie you should watch. I recommend this. Have you seen the movie Life is Beautiful? Yes. Go see. It was Academy Award. What year was Life is Beautiful, Zach? That was uh, 97, 90, 98. 97, 98. 98, something like that. 98. Go see this movie. It will change your life because he gets put into a concentration camp right. with his son and he turns it into a game. Yes. Because he knew everybody there was sentenced to die. Yes. So... I, when I watched that, I was like, this guy has the magic superpower. Yes. He got the superpower. He's in a death camp, but his per he altered perception. So the millionaire mentor mentality, number three, okay, is you have to alter current reality for you. You literally, almost like hallucinogenics. Even though some people are big on taking this ayahuasca drug, um, Steve Jobs took hallucinogenic LC LSD and said that that it helped him be more creative than Bill Gates because Bill Gates wouldn't do it. I'm not sure that's true, but um, I got a better way to do it. You don't, there's no side effects. There's no LSD needed. What you do is you go, I will alter complete perceptions away from what I grew up with because basically childhood is what ruins everybody. Yeah. Or what makes you amazing. And that inner circle of people in the world, they're raising their kids different than you and I. I was raised by a single mom. Um, you know, James, you weren't raised by parents that ever made a million bucks. No, right? no, I wasn't. And I, it was always ingrained into, into me, get a job, get a job, get a job. Right out of high school, my mother was like pushing me, you need to get a job, you get a job. And at the time, it was a recession in Australia. It was 1993. And so when I actually got a job, which right. as a reporter at a newspaper my environment if you will my mother my my father my friends everyone was like oh my god james got a job that's amazing great work james got a job and so it was instilled in me like get a job yeah and then make money and then save and then buy a house and then get married and then have kids that was like the, the culture that was ingrained right. into me and i i mean i don't have many regrets but like if i had to look back and and have it changed I would have wished that my mother and father had pushed me into entrepreneurship. Yeah, and said, and, and I would have, I would have loved if my dad had said when I was ten, James, go out and run a lemonade stand yeah. out the front of the house. But he didn't. Right. It was always like, go to school. Is all, then, are Australians entrepreneurial or not as much? No, they are. They are. But yeah. it was just you know, it's my, my look. I I was raised well. You know, good yeah. morals, good values, but. There was no entrepreneurship in my in my yeah. in my family, so I never learned that. And my environment was always the same. It was like go to school, and then when you get out of school, either get a job or you go to college, and then you get a job. Yeah. And that was it. So, um, you know, I wish I could turn back the clock and just say, like, right out of high school, learn how to be an entrepreneur. Otherwise, I wouldn't feel like I'm playing catch up like I am now. Like I'm right. 42. And I feel like I'm playing catch up on money making and wealth creation because for 20 years, I just bought into this idea like you got to get a job and yeah. you just got to pay the bills and, you know, we and think wealthy. about it, what you're doing now at your age, don't you see how you basically could have done the same thing? Could have done it. Could've done you could have done that at 18. Yeah. It's it, crazy. It, it, was, it was a mentality and it yeah. was the environment and what they were telling me. Yep. So my parents and my friends and my peers 
were all telling me go get a job and so that's what i did and yep. then when i got a job i felt terrific about it but now now that i know what i know right you I'm, shouldn't have felt terrific i'm pissed off yeah <laughs> i'm like pissed that's why so step number four in the psychology of zero to a million dollars you have to unprogram or reprogram most of what you learned in your childhood now you don't have to learn, you don't have to repro like James said, he had good morals and his parents taught him, you know, follow the 10 commandment kind of Judeo Christic mm -hmm. Christian ethic and stuff like that. That's not, doesn't need to be changed, but your person, this podcast episode, radio episode is specifically around the concept of going from zero to a million. And to do that, you, I promise you, we're going to have however many people watch this live. 10, 20, 30, 40, it's probably about 50,000 people will watch this live on Facebook and Instagram right now. And out of 50,000, 49,900 of them, for sure, of you watching right now, you got to reprogram everything you were taught about money. It took me exactly 20 years to change my mentality. Yeah. About, about making money. So I was 17 when I left high school and I got a job. Yeah. And then I was 37 when I hired you to coach me in making money. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll get to mentorship in a second, but it was 20 years of, of a culture and a mindset of just earn a salary, yeah. put a salary ceiling and move from job to job to job. And you're right, I could have... I could have hired a coach or a mentor or I could have had a different mindset 20 years earlier when I was 17. I, f I feel like it's like the lost 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the, mo the most painful thing you will ever experience in life is the loss of time. Everything else can be made up for. You can remake money, you, but time is a bitch, boy. Time is this thing. It's like slippery sand that goes between your fingers and you can't yeah. bring it back. It, once it slips through your hands, into your fingers, and onto the floor, you, there's no picking it up. I used to make fun, when I was in my early 20s, I used to make fun of people in their like 30s or 40s who would say, oh man, time goes so fast. You wait, you wait, you wake up one day and you'll be 30, you'll be yeah. 40. Now I'm 40 and I'm the one who's saying that, man, time is going Gonna so go fast. fast. Cause I don't know about you, but I'm like every single day I wake up now, it's like tick, 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 yeah. tick, tick. And I go, where the hell did the last year go? Yeah. And now you look back and you go, damn, you start having a conversation where it's like, yeah, 20 years ago when I was doing that, Kate here was <laughs> was just telling me that she was, the, the the year that I went out on my first date, she was being born. <laughs> yeah, Kate. Kate's still a young one. Yeah. She's still, but Kate, but it's a lucky one because she gets to be around me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many advantages to that, Kate. Yeah. No, learning about bit. No, just not really. Um, not humility. really. You can learn humility. <laughs> no, no, not from that side. But I mean, you get to learn shit that ain't nobody teaching in school. Some of you are in college. Look, I've spoken at the top colleges in the world, Harvard and London Business School and USC. There's some smart kids in there. But I promise you, um, well, every time I go there, I talk about stuff and they're like, I've never heard that before. Even if they're in grad school, getting an MBA in business, because me and James are in the trenches of business right now. Whereas a professor is getting their information from people like us. So a lot of universities, for example, use my videos as like example of viral business marketing videos. So I'm like, well, I did the damn video. These guys are trying to study. They're always playing catch up. So anyway, rewire the brain and let me just get to how you do that because this is what james was bringing up so i think we're on step four step three or five um the way you reprogram your brain is the trickiest one because i'll tell you what you can't do you cannot um um you cannot sit in a room and go, I don't like myself. I want to rewire how I think. It Unfortunately, no matter how hard you try, cry, get angry and get frustrated, nothing changes. So one of the things that you have to do is imagine you were training your brain like you train your body. So let's just imagine you're 150 pounds overweight, okay? 200 pounds overweight. 
So you walk into a gym. Well, let's say you're at home and you're depressed. You look in the mirror after you take a shower and you're like, wow, I am 200 pounds overweight. <laughs> so let's say you cry. You get angry. You eat ice cream because you're frustrated. <laughs> Nothing changes. You just get fatter and more depressed. So let's say you're, what would you do? Let's just say, what. let's give some examples. What would you advise? I'll take some live recommendations. To a friend of yours who is 150 pounds overweight and sick of it and wants to reprogram their body to be healthy. What are some of the things? Somebody said, Kate, you're beautiful, baby. You got a, um, a fan. <laughs> Somebody said you can't rewire your thoughts manufacture your brain chemistry. Someone said, Ty's a walking book. <laughs> That's a compliment. Someone said they would recommend they cut sugar, bread, and cut fast food. Walk a thousand steps, 10,000 steps a day. Pizza. Eat pineapple pizza. Just <laughs> go on a diet, Lewis Pina 100 says. Uh, I'll Take tell you what I do. Steps. Yeah. Okay. So let me suggest they start walking, eat clean, diet and cut calories. James, what do you recommend? I would recommend having that person get around a bunch of people who are fit and healthy. I would, I would recommend that they get into an environment where their six closest friends or the six people they spend the most time with have six pack abs right. or are going to the gym or are eating clean or are health conscious because you learn by osmosis visualization as well i'd stick a picture of the body that you wanted on your fridge every day or on your phone so you're always seeing it hmm. that's um, good so yeah. visualization uh, is huge um but the main thing would be getting around people who already have the body that you want right. to get to yeah and, and i that's what i would basically say i mean i would say the honest truth out and i'll add one thing to that get a personal trainer because who here has ever worked out with or without a personal trainer? Yeah, I, There's not once that I'm better off working out alone in a gym versus somebody pushing me. Never. Right. You, and if you don't believe me, look at the top bodybuilders in the world. Uh, sometimes um, uh, Mr. Olympia trains me. Mr. Olympia, he won Mr. Olympia Classic. Danny Hester, he won last year. He trains with other people. Arnold Schwarzenegger, he comp always was working out with Franco Colombo all every single so if you take somebody who's 150 pounds overweight and you just say go on a diet that's what some people are saying ain't nobody sticking to that that's no. why they're fat no. because they know that everybody's smart enough to not so when it comes to making money if you have no money so you're like the you're like the financial version of somebody 200 pounds overweight then my if you follow what James says you try to then go out and find six people or make sure the six people you spend the most of your time with are badasses and at least making 10 times more money than you. Yeah. If you do that now, the other thing is, and this is what I recommend to the overweight person, get a personal trainer and you well, you can do the same thing what financially. Everybody, I'll tell you the answer to that. Joel Salatin used to tell me when everybody, anybody in the modern world says they can't afford something, just when they say, I don't have money, just for add two that. words for that. Because yeah. people make money for all the stupidest things. No problem. Yeah. I mean, you go to the, I, you, if you go to the ghettos, people still got rims. People still got iPhones. Hmm. Yeah, it's true. Save a week's worth of McDonald's and some weed. <laughs> week's <laughs> worth of McDonald's. Someone up there said. Oh, Get is that what someone said? Yeah. Getting a personal trainer as well. It, like, obviously you want to get as as good a personal trainer as you can but even if that personal trainer is just mediocre right as long as they're better than that person yes. as long as they're better than you correct and if you've invested money to have a personal trainer guess what that is accountability yeah when you wake up on a monday wednesday and friday and you've already paid to yes. go and see a trainer on a monday wednesday tell them friday, you want a no refund policy you're showing up yeah because otherwise you're just setting fire to your money, or else right? you text them and are like oh i don't want to do it and you know what people always say? They say, well, back. why do I need a personal personal trainer? I can do that for free. I can go to the gym for free. Well, you can. But you won't. But will you? Yeah. And most of the time, the answer is no, you won't. No. As soon as you pay. That was like, that was honestly. Somebody says, does he train with kangaroos? 
<laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good cheap comedy. Yeah. <laughs> good what, cheap comedy. What I have learned is, um, you know, I was always the guy who would get stuff for free, right? I'd go to free seminars, free conferences. If there was a course or a program, I'd try to get someone to give me the pirated copy. Right. And I would get all of this stuff for free and I prided myself on it. But the problem was, is that I didn't really make any massive progress because I didn't value it. Yeah. When you pay for it. As soon as I yeah. paid for it, yeah. I focused, I paid attention. When you pay, you pay attention. And that was like, the, that's probably been the biggest breakthrough for me in all areas of my life, my health, my, my uh, fitness and finance my relationships it's paying for coaching yeah here's the thing i can get all of that stuff for free on youtube i can youtube like how to make a million dollars i can youtube the best investing advice from warren buffett and i can watch those videos and then i can go and open up a investing account and put money into it and do those things but i never did right but as soon as i like went into my own bank account and i paid someone and right. i gave someone money what it did is that it made me just have this tunnel, singular focus, which inspired me to take action. Yeah. Ultimately, I lost weight. I put on muscle. I got a business coach. I started a business. I made money. That's the, that's a huge component, like paying. Yeah. That's why I say, you know, it takes money to make money. Mm. I'm like, yeah, it takes money to make money, but it not always how people think. Like you can start a business for under a hundred bucks in America. Almost any, you name a business, I can get into it for under a hundred bucks. Anything. I mean, even complicated things because you can make a prototype, an easy prototype. So what I like to do is take the money and invest it in someone to teach me. And sometimes it's buying a plane ticket. That's one of the best things you can do with money. Mm. Buy a plane ticket because the odds are, depending on where you live, that the people who have the information that you need don't live next door. And they're not coming your way. So I've gotten on. I mean, the furthest I ever went was from Los Angeles to Tasmania. Yeah. And I went to India. I've, I've been on, you know, 28-hour airplane rides going to learn something. So that's a good. And you get the plus of traveling and enjoying life. The other thing, and I'll throw this out because I always talk about this, if you know my brand, books. So here's the thing about books. Because some people go, oh, well, then you get book smart, but you don't do it and it doesn't blah, 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 blah. People are stupid about this subject. Let me tell you the truth. Every single day you should read and every single day you should act upon what you learn. And so it's not, why do people think it has to be one or the other? So I read, you know, right now this, and I've, I have many different habits. Right now I read right when I wake up before I do anything. So I spent about one, this morning I finished a book called uh, Personality by Daniel Nettle. And I actually read another book. I, I was kind of finishing, finished the last half of two books. So two different books and one. And I, I read Dan, um, Dunbar, Robin Dunbar, his book on love. It's basically what's the science of why humans fall in love. So learned stuff because one of the big things in going from zero to a million dollars is you have to be good at reading people. Okay. So the best way to learn to read people, learn theoretical and then go try to apply it that same day. So what I was learning today, what Daniel Nettle's big thing is the five main components of humans personality that you have to learn to read it. You have to learn. Um, it's ba He bases this book around something called the big five, which I like hexaco, which is actually six, but he does big five. So, you learn to read people's neuroticism. It's the number one thing you got to learn to read. So like when you hire people, James, um, you need to know their neuro because too low of neuroticism and they're like a hippie. They, they're like the one that frustrates you because they never double check their work. Mm. Okay. They're never worried. But neuroticism in general, you want to be low because neuroticism is, re is overreaction to small things. We've all been around... A neurotic person so the next one is conscientiousness and this was the issue that you had so I'm taking theoretical and I'm putting practical well scientists have found if somebody's not conscientious then guess what they will make a lot of mistakes around you you'll give them a job they won't be proactive they're not hard workers they're not perfectionists they're not organized some of you 
listening to this right now have very low conscientiousness. By the way, if you always ask me, I get one of the most common questions, how do you overcome procrastination? You're actually a low conscientiousness person. Conscientious people don't procrastinate. They can make internal goals and follow them. So if you're somebody who makes goals and then breaks them within a week or two, without a doubt, you have low conscientiousness. But that's only one of five factors. Then you have extroversion. So extroverted people are, there's different way, most people don't know what they're talking about. Extroversion, if you've done a like a Myers-Briggs test, you might say you're an extrovert or introvert. It's not whether you're shy. Shyness has very little to do with extroversion. Extroversion is your response to novel new things. So if somebody is an extrovert, if you're watching, you like to go to parties because there'll be new people there to meet. Whereas introverts are not motivated by new things every day. An introvert can be happy at home reading the same book they've been reading all week. In fact, they get new, they get pleasure from not something new. So sometimes introverts are confusing because you can actually be a shy extrovert. You know that? I mean, a shy, yeah, shy extrovert is possible. In fact, Kate is probably a shy extrovert. Like she comes off. I always thought Kate was an introvert, but uh, I told you. Yeah, <laughs> well, most most amateur people would say you're an introvert, but Kate is like an under cover secret extrovert who's like ah let's do <laughs> new stuff and so so anyway what i'm talking about now in the steps the mindset it has to be a mindset that you want to learn theoretical things and you want to do action because about 80 percent of the advice you're going to get out there about how to go from a zero to a million dollars will be like forget the theoretical just go do stuff but think about how you build an airplane do you want a person who goes, you know what? Forget all this engineering architecture stuff. Forget all that. I just go out and I just take a, a wrench and a bolt gun and some welding equipment and I just piece together an airplane. That airplane's going to crash. So you need theoretical. You need people or you need to be somebody who sits in an engineering you know, room on a computer creating the exact measurements of the airplane, the theoretical on paper. And then you got to go out and also build the airplane. So it's a two-step process. So to go from zero to a million, I find that some people have no theoretical. They're literally building an airplane, a 747, from their, out of their ass by intuition. And they're like, just work harder. If it doesn't fly, just work harder. And I'm like, dude, you just crash faster. You know your, your Lamborghini commercial where you go and everyone mimics you and they go, knowledge, yeah. right? knowledge. An actual fact, what would have been better than knowledge would have been applied knowledge. Right. Because knowledge isn't power, it's applied knowledge. It's yes. what you do with that. Because people always say, oh, yeah, look, I read, I read books all the time. That's great. Well, that's terrific. But what did you do with the information that you learned from that book? But you know what? I'm going to do a ch something to challenge those people. Because I get people going, oh, the problem in the world is people just read books all the time, but they don't do it. What world are you in with that people read smart books every day? My ass. The truth is people buy books, put it next to their bed and never read them. Yeah. And then they go, oh, yeah, I've been reading up uh, about <laughs> investing like what? No bullshit. I'll ask you three questions. You don't know jack shit about anything. It's not true. Wealthy people. No theory and they know applied. I promise you. You know, if you go to your medical doctor. And you need help? You don't think he knows the theory of the anatomy of the human body? You think you go, uh, my spleen. You think he'll be like, spleen. What is a spleen? I don't know what a... Dude, they memorized spleen in the second year of business school. They got book smart. And this then... What? You said business school. Uh, medical school. Thank you. Yeah, but, but you don't want a doctor that has no book knowledge. He goes, you know what I do? I just get in there. I just cut you open, get in that heart <laughs> cavity, and I just every every heart's a new is a mystery to me. <laughs> she'll, and I just she'll be right, mate. Yeah. Let's cut you open she, and have a look. No just, worries. She's I'll figure right, it out mate. when I'm in there. No, hell no. But you also don't want a doctor who's never done an operation. Right. 
So, but I was just going to say, next time people bring up this phantom problem in the world, because it is a damn phantom, I see people being like, we live in a world where people are just reading and learning. I'm like, where? Where, dude? <laughs> where is this? Because I talk to a lot of people. I don't, and some smart and some not smart, but the smart ones, I mean, the not so smart ones, it's never because they're reading too much. I don't know one damn person that if you get to the bottom of why they're at zero and not a million, you know what? It's those 40 hours a week I've been reading <laughs> for the last two years. Bullshit. If, because remember what, and this is the next mindset principle. I think we're on number seven or something, six or seven. Bill Gates says if he had a choice between people, he'll always choose the lazy man to do a job. Because he says he'll know he will do it quicker. Yeah. Because when you're lazy, you're like, just for example, let's say you need, you're going to add on to your house. So you got to build a foundation for a, a guest house in your backyard. So would you want some dude who comes to you and he's just like, you know what? I'm so good with a shovel. You give me the next 19 days and I will dig a hole, man. I am a hard worker. You don't want that guy. You want the dude who's like your next door neighbor. I had one of these in North Carolina, um, Bradley Thede. He was my neighbor when I moved to North Carolina. And we wanted to build a basketball court in the woods behind my house because I was really into basketball. And um, I remember we were like, should we chop down trees and do 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 And then Bradley Thede, he had this country accent. I remember I remember as the first people I ever met that I realized actually thought WWE wrestling was real. Like I was over at their house and I was like, oh, you, this is so fake. And they, a whole family turned to me like, what? <laughs> I was like the first person that ever said that to them. But anyway, back to, you know, I need this, this basketball court. His day, he just goes, he used to talk like this. Hi, Ty. That's exactly how he sounded. He go, hey, Ty, my dad will just, Bring the bobcat over. And his dad just drove over with a bobcat. I'll never forget. Little little tractor bobcat. Knock, push the trees down. Skid. He did it in like two hours. And I had this dirt backyard. Ha, ta. Hi, ta. Efficiency. Efficiency. So in the mindset, remember I said you got to reprogram the mindset. One of the mindset things that you have to reprogram is the fixation of a uh, uh, with not using tools and mark my words, what separates people on the path to zero to a million are the people who use better tools. If you have a knife, I don't care if you can bench press 500 pounds. If I got a gun and we're 20 feet apart, you gonna die. It's like that scene in Indiana Jones, uh, Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark, where, where Indiana Jones is up against the guy with the sword and he's doing the fancy sword tricks and then Indiana Jones just pulls out his gun and shoots just him. Just shoots him. Not unless him. you have bad aim. No, trust me. <laughs> if you have bad I don't aim. have bad aim. And at 50 yards, you're going to die if you're running at me and I got a fully loaded weapon. What's, so, the, what's the phrase? I think it was, um, was it Franklin who talked about the man sharpening the axe? Like he's yes. got two guys like... What, uh, and their goal is to cut down a tree. It's like spent one hour or 23 hours sharpening the axe yes. and an hour chopping yes. it down rather than the other guy who's going to just start chopping right away. That's a perfect analogy. So spend hours every day sharpening your brain Yes. and then go out and you'll execute very quickly because or else what's going to happen, mark my words, is you're going to get good at the wrong thing. I, I must admit that I wasted a lot of time thinking that doing lots of action was the best course. And so I would, because I was feeling productive, because I was doing lots of things, I was like, okay, I'm accomplishing a lot. Right. But then when I actually sat back and looked at it and I was like, you know what? I'm going to actually now do thinking time. I'm just going to yep. just think, just yeah. shut off all distractions and just think, how should I spend my day? Like, what should I do? What actually makes money what is the how should i prioritize my day i found that um my business increased exponentially from doing that yeah so rather than just like action 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 moving 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 it was like right think sharpen the axe what is the action i should take yep and a lot of times it was like three times less action that i ordinarily yeah. would have taken but it was th at least three times more powerful action right you sharpen the axe yeah yeah, well, these guys like Warren Buffett, they read eight hours a day. 
These dudes reading eight hours a day. Yeah. You know how much money? Now, next time someone tells you they got a better plan than Warren Buffett, just remember, Warren Buffett's business makes $200 billion a year. Let me repeat that. Can you <laughs> combine? He owns about 75 companies. Some he owns completely and some he owns partial ownership. But his combined holdings, gross revenue per year, it's not $200 million because that's still a lot. Even $20 million is a lot or $200 million. Or two billion. His is two hundred billion dollars, and he reads from like nine a.m. until he reads five all day. p.m. all day. And yeah. his business partner Charlie Munger reads. Charlie Munger says, "I'm a book. I'm a my my family calls me a book with two legs." So I'm always sitting there reading. Now, if you don't like to read, you can do podcasts. You can do mm. audio books. But when people say they don't like to read, I'm like, why do you not like read? Well, Ty, I don't like to read because. I get bored. Well, the whole point is that reading teaches you to focus. Mm. So, yeah, you can't just skip that by doing by doing audiobooks. You know, people go, "Uh, oh. somebody said I don't believe you, Ty." Mm, you can look up publicly traded company Warren Buffett and see that's 200 billion dollars. So, you don't have to believe me. It's a publicly traded company. What well, just a side note on Warren Buffett. He said uh, two years ago at the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholders meeting, which we mm -hmm. went to in Omaha, Nebraska, he said that there would be more millionaires made in the next three years than there have been already in history. In history, yeah. And we're already two years in, two yeah. years into that, so there has never been a better time. Like I said, to make what Warren Buffett dollars. was saying is, it's easy to if it was hard, it's for sure, in my opinion, harder to stay in shape for ten years. Than it is to make money for ten years. It is. I would I would agree with that. Yeah. Staying in shape because food's all around you. It's I mean, trickier. I'm sitting here. I'm in fairly good shape, but Kate brought out some cookies here, <laughs> and I'm, I'm I'm arms distance from it, cookies. and I'm I'm fighting an inner war with myself right <laughs> Kate, now. James going, has been I distracted this whole time. I'm gonna, <laughs> James, I'm gonna push James. these closer. <laughs> Kate, why did Take you bring away. such junky food? It's yeah. gluten free. Somebody said, where is, all right, let's do a giveaway. Let's give away a hundred bucks. Let's take a, oh, so we're going to do a giveaway based on today's sponsor, which is a company that James owns and him and his brother started that I'm in a business partner in now too. See these glasses we're wearing? James, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Wait, let me do one thing. Film this on your phone, just vertical, uh, horizontal, sorry. And we're going to do a little, just kind of, you can glance back between us okay. and come in close. And so start on me. Okay. I'm going to do a giveaway on today's podcast. What are we wearing, Kate? We are wearing blue blocker glasses. The specific brand, Swannies. I'm here with James Swanick, who's been on my podcast. And let me ask you, I'm a, James wanted to interview me about the glasses, but I, since it's on my podcast... <laughs> people, you know what people say about these glasses? They say, um, Ty, you look like Tony Stark. Because does Tony Stark wear yeah. these? I've been getting a lot of... Yeah, I get Tony a lot of Tony Stark. I yeah. wish I was Tony Stark. Jack, I Nicholson, Jack Nicholson wears them as well. The whole yeah. So let me tell you about cool these. So this is today's sponsor <laughs> yeah. of my podcast. I usually don't do sponsors, but I'm going to start doing sponsors. The Swanee Blue Blocker Glasses. And I'm going to put a link for anybody who wants to buy them. They're not expensive, but you can go to tylopez.com slash sleep. Why? What is one of the main reasons people don't sleep well? Like people, if, and by the way, if you can't sleep, your life's going to be crap and you ain't going to make money. <laughs> one of the main reasons is because you are staring into your cell phone right now or your television screen or your computer screen. And it is emitting an artificial blue light which is stimulating your pineal gland and preventing your body from creating melatonin. And melatonin is what you need to be able to fall asleep, to be able to sleep deeply and ultimately wake up feeling nice and refreshed. So every Sunday night you're at home watching Game of Thrones on HBO, you're staring into your TV screen, which is emitting that artificial blue light, which is preventing mm -hmm. your body from naturally creating melatonin. You're watching me right now on your cell phone, right? You're looking at me, you're looking at Ty. Your cell phone right now is emitting an artificial electronic blue light. And when you look into that light, 
it's stimulating that pineal and pituitary gland and your body is unable to produce melatonin. Basically, it, it's basically this. Your body be, thinks you're waking up because they think the sun is hitting it. Yeah, you, when you when look you, into it. When you wake, yeah. that's, how do you think people lived in ancient times before alarm clocks? Your ancestors, your great-great-grandparents, even 100 years ago, they woke up when the sun came up and before electricity, they went to sleep when the sun went down. So now... We basically have all these alarm clocks, the sun rising every time you look at your phone. I'll tell you this. If you look at your phone at night, which I do sometimes, Netflix or whatever, if you don't wear these glasses, I notice a significant difference. And there's real science behind this, yeah. right? Yeah, they've done Harvard studies. There's dozens and dozens of studies on this. So the orange lens blocks out that blue light, Yep, which means you can continue watching Ty on your YouTube stream and you can continue watching Game of Thrones and you can continue using your computer at nighttime but still know that you're going to be able to fall asleep the way that nature intended you to fall asleep and you're still going to be able to sleep deeply because here's the thing people people are addicted to their electronics right yep. and we're, we're not changing that anytime soon right like, but if you can block that blue light while using your electronics, your sleep will improve dramatically. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So um, how c is it different than the low light um, option on your phone? Yeah, so that's a, great, that's a great thing. So if you have an iPhone, there's a setting called night, night shift. Night mode, yeah. Yeah, night shift. And what that'll do is it will reduce the amount of blue light in your phone, and that's mm -hmm. great. That really helps. There's also an, um, a free app on your computer, which you can download download called flux if you go to f period l u x same thing at nighttime the brightness level will start to automatically yeah. dim it'll take out the blue light that will also help but here's the thing that doesn't prevent the blue light hitting you from your bathroom light from your tv screen from your lamp next to your bed from the alarm clock i mean sense. the way that you brush your teeth at night is destroying your sleep you want to know why because of the Lights yeah, the because you brush your teeth in the bathroom light, yeah. right? So you're brushing your teeth. You just got to brush your teeth in the dark then. There you go. You know what? <laughs> that is the best thing. Here's the best thing you can do to sleep well. It's basically when the sun goes down, sit in the dark. Yeah, that's <laughs> sit it. Sit in the dark. Is anyone going to do that? No. Yeah. So next best thing is wear a pair of blue light blocking glasses. Looking use night shift on your you iPhone. Sit. I think Android's, the, the setting is um, called Twilight. Yeah, that also reduces the the blue light exposure. And then if you've got a computer, download Flux. That will, will help. But a like lot James as well. said, I've tried that. The problem is, the freaking lights from above. Distra I've noted. I, you'll see. For those of you who buy these, I'm gonna put a link. Tylopez.com/sleep. So go to my website, Tylopez.com/sleep. And once you get that, you will see that. You, it's actually weird. If I travel and I forget these glasses, I like, I'm like, wait a second. I notice it. Yeah. Like I'm like something's wrong. And so you start putting these on at a, what about nine at night? Yeah, I put them on about an hour before I go to sleep each night. So, um, you know, you can put them on two hours before you go to sleep if you want. But for me, it's like 45 minutes, an hour. I'll put them on, and then I will not take them off until I've turned the light off. So what a lot of people make the mistake doing, they put the glasses on, they think, oh, great, I'm blocking the blue light. And then at the last moment, they'll take them off and go and brush their teeth and then the light's hitting their eyes. So what yeah. I'll do is I'll put them on about an hour before I want to sleep and they will stay on right up until I'll turn the light off and then I'll take the glasses off and I'll go to sleep. Yeah. So you don't want any light exposure. Yeah, yeah I turn the light off and then take them off. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Turn the light off and then take them off. So if you have trouble falling asleep or you toss and turn in the night or even if you get seven or eight hours and you wake up and you're still feeling tired, chances are it's because you're, you're staring into too much light at night. And that's from your cell phone, your TV screen, your bathroom light, your TV light. There's too much light at night. Yeah. So your so options are aviator style and... That style? You're, you're very fashionable with that style. She they likes are. the aviators. What I do you like think? I like the aviators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are good on you. They're rocking. Thank you. So we're going to give away. What I want to give away some money. I'm not going to give. People are like give away a pair. We'll give away money. Buy a pair if you want a pair. Like James said, when you give away stuff, people aren't going to wear them. We'll give away some some other time. But tylopez.com slash sleep. Now let's give away 100 bucks. 
first person who answers this. Based on what James just said, what are the what's the funny word gland that's in your brain that effect gets affected by light for a PayPal hundred bucks? Yeah, there's it's actually the, two. There's actually there's two. two. We'll yeah. take either of them. Or both that make it challenging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we'll we'll keep it. What is one? Let's see. There's a delay on Facebook and Instagram, so it takes a second. There we go. Hutch Heelan wins. What did he say? What Pineal mean? gland. There you go. Some people say, oh, Elias, you just missed it. Hutch beat, beat you on Facebook. Don't worry, I'm still going to give away this iPhone 7. So, we're back from commercial break. Thank you, James. Sponsorship, tylopez.com slash sleep. It's a partnership I have, an affiliate partnership with um, Swanee sleep glasses. They're pretty cool. I wear them, and I'm not just saying that. I don't just wear them just for them to be my sponsor. I like literally have been wearing them for, what, about a year? Yeah, I think so. Got well, how, have you found, how, how have you found your sleep has improved all Definitely. your nighttime? I routine. notice it when I travel and I forget them, that I don't fall asleep as quickly and as deeply. You'll sleep deeper is what I find. Yeah. I still get about the same hours, but deeper. Yeah, we actually did a study of people on on sleep. We asked them, would you prefer an hour's extra sleep or an hour's better quality oh, sleep? Oh, better quality. It's, and it's yeah. better quality, like 85% of people said better quality. I've slept 12 hours before and woke up tired. Really? I do that. Oh, yeah. Somebody said, can I have Kate's number? Yes. It's... Uh, it's 555. Yeah. 27. No, it's... Three, um, Nine one one. Tell them you have an emergency and you need to contact Kate. But just out of interest, so if you did have Kate's number, what would you do? <laughs> Nothing. He would probably send a dick pic or some stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> what would be that's my favorite your thing approach? That uh, hey, if you ask, cut your number it, off the podcast. If you, <laughs> read, but any girl gets pictures where guys send naked pictures. I'm like, yeah, the girls are like, oh, he's a dream boat. <laughs> Girls don't really think, you know what it is? It just shows you that people are so narcissistic, whatever attracts them, they assume that will work. So if a guy, if a girl sends a guy a naked picture, it's like, yeah, that's how guys <laughs> yeah. think. That's how your brain, even if, even if like, you it's know, like it's, random yeah, things. even if it's just a raunchy picture, but there's literally very few women. If you ever meet a woman who wants strangers to send them <laughs> nude pictures of yeah. men, this chick is probably insane. Okay, what's the best pickup line you've ever heard, and what's the worst? The best one. Um, I don't know about best. I don't really like pickup lines. I just like. People. Well, what was the best approach? It didn't have to be a pickup line. It could have just been the way that someone approached you. What was like um, a really classy just when, way? I Hi, think, my name's Ty. How just, are you? Just when people are casual, like. <laughs> I don't know when people are. What's up, dog? <laughs> the best one was what did Herman say last night? Oh yeah, my <laughs> friend has the worst pickup lines about. Do you have a pirate in the house or something? Yeah, because there's Cause a treasure inside. It was like the worst. He's from Argentina. In Argentina, that is that's something. All right, that works. All right, all right. Somebody said, "Ha ha 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 ha." Ty. Um. Someone said. Drop your glasses and make the woman put them on you. That is Jason <laughs> Jeremy's. Jason, you look young, and I'm advice? concerned what you're going to be like when you grow up. <laughs> because your idea of a very cool thing to do was for me to take these off and then Kate to put the. Is that like a weird fetish guys have? You know, it really turns me on when it's a woman peculiar. puts my glasses on. There's some weird people, man. Uh, what do you think of... Who? Saul Alinsky? Muscular. No. Don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. My roles has night vision. Saul Alinsky? Yeah, who's Saul Alinsky? He wrote, uh, he's, he's the guy that wrote the, uh, like, all the communist people that wrote that book. The, uh, not the American. Shit. Not <laughs> is he a communist, Zach? Is that what you're trying to say? An economist oh, okay. or a communist? Communist. Commie. Communist. We Zach call him is commie. A walking Somebody said, Jason said it's supposed to be romantic. Rules for radicals. Rules for radicals, yeah. There we go. Someone said, man, these comments kill me. Uh, Barack Obama's motivation. Not motivation, but 
one of Hillary's biggest influences. Is that true? She was influenced by a communist writer? All, all the left. It's not like the... Is it Zach s- says all the left. Is it sexist that we... Zach, why aren't you on this, man? Yeah, okay. Is it sexist that we call Hillary Clinton Hillary by her first name? Like, we don't call Donald Trump Donald. Some people do. Mm. It's because I think Clinton. It'll be confusing yeah. to call But we don't Hillary. call Taylor Swift Swift. We call her Taylor, right? Right. But we call Kanye Kanye. Mm. I think it's just whatever sounds the best. <laughs> okay. Somebody say, we back. Catchy. When you got money and all your dreams begin to come true... Yeah, money doesn't necessarily bring you all your dreams. Money is just one of many, one of four things you got to get right. Yeah. You got to get four basic things right in life. Approximately right. Your money, your health, your love life, and your happiness. And those, you get those four basically and right. And you know what I learned? Sleep about, is under health. What I've learned about happiness as well recently is that humans are not designed to be happy. Yes. Humans are designed to survive. Yep. And so then happiness truly is a choice or, and a skill that you actually have to learn. Happiness is unnatural for the most part. That's why oh, yeah. I actually posted on Twitter yesterday. I said, what will make, if you think about this, you'll get it. What makes you happy doesn't necessarily make you survive. And what makes you survive often doesn't make you happy. So what makes you survive, for example, if you ask a scientist, is neuroticism. So neuroticism is reacting to overreacting. Like, so let's just say this. Let's say you're a woman or you're a guy and you've been dating someone for a year and they've always acted one way. And then all of a sudden they come home a little later than normal. A little acting a little different, a little more secretive. You're like, where were you? And oh, they make up a lame excuse. What are you going to do? The brain's going to stay start racing. Oh, well, are they cheating on me? Are they what? 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 And so that's neuroticism. You're reacting. You're becoming neurotic. Now, why do you become neurotic? Well, because that's how you protect yourself. Because you don't want to be somebody. You don't want to be a dude who doesn't realize every night his girlfriend is going out sleeping with other guys. You don't want to be that guy that you figure it out one or two years later, right? So. That process of becoming alert and aware of your circumstances is an unhappy experience. Ignorance is bliss, but do you want to be ignorant? Let me actually just do a poll. If you had a choice, James, okay, you're married. Let's pretend you're married to a woman. I w- that definitely is pretending, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say if you get married, you're not married now, but if you got married mm-hmm. and you your best you? friend finds out after 10 years of marriage, he walks in on her sleeping with some guy. Okay. Mm. Would you want him? And let's just assume for the purpose of this, that she's, or this could be, you could flip it. Guy, girl, doesn't it's matter. It's not an open relationship. It's a, no, a it's monogam- not. A, it's your wife, the mother of your kids, or if you, you know, the father. And in this example, she'll never do it again. It was a one time event. Mm. Do you want your best friend to come the next day and be like, dude, I got some bad news to tell you. Or do you want him to just go, she'll never do it again. Let's just drop it and he'll be and happy. Assuming you were happy with her, what would you want? Would you want to be ignorant, bliss, or to be aware and unhappy? <laughs> and I want to get Zach's opinion on this too. Uh, yeah. I think I'd probably still want to, I think I would, I would want to know. Yeah, I would want to know. You would want to know. Yeah, I would want to know. But I would even if it's going to make you miserable, I, you're going to end up getting divorced. It would, might make me happy. It would be like, oh, thank God, now I have a great reason to leave her. No, no, I'm assuming it was a happy marriage. You oh, okay. loved her. Everything was going great. Sure. Um, because it ain't never going to be the same once you get that news. So that, and then the other uh, the other option is never. Knowing, he never, never tells you, and she him. never does it again. Yeah, well, in that case, then I'd take the ignorance if I never knew and I never oh. suspected it. Then I, then I would, I would probably choose that. Zach, what you going with? Wait, yeah, you. I gotta share mics because yeah, we're going with the cheap Zoom right now. Uh, I, I would want to know. 
you'd want to know. Yeah. You're like me. I got to know. I'm like, I, I, even if it would make me miserable, I'm just like, now, Kate. I don't think it necessarily has to make you Kate, miserable. Kate, if it was a guy, what would you do? If it was 100%. I'm sorry, wait a minute. How hot is your How wife? How hot is my wife? I thought you were going to say, is the guy. Is is it, uh, is it Kate Beckinsale? Is it like out of my league and she's the only one I'll ever be able to get at She's the level? Game of Thrones dragon no the the assistant the the helper of the or the zach red, the red queen zach likes the girl from um game of thrones no the black girl that's this that works with the dragon queen with oh, the yeah, big yeah. poofy the, hair the british girl yeah the british that's girl Dama's friend the, the yeah. actress is there oh i Kate know beckinsale is terrific by the way yeah but she's older now <laughs> <laughs> sorry you know what's crazy Kate beckinsale was terrific. have you seen her daughter looks like her really yeah not quite as pretty but no, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Is it just missionary <laughs> that they did? Is it just missionary position that does we're talking matter? about here? That it does matter. It, that, that <laughs> uh, Zach with the great questions there. Uh, I don't know if I'd be devastated to find it out either. I think I, 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 my personality is such that I would w welcome the... Trying to sort it out. Like you would trying, welcome it. Be I mean, like, I would. I would welcome the this challenge. This has been a great day. I found out my wife is cheating. I on would me. welcome the challenge of working through it. How do you know it's a hundred percent one time though? Because it's just a because it's hypothetical. James is a kink, so <laughs> okay. James then. is like really into kink. So <laughs> James. That's why he's a little more cool. With it. Somebody like, said Zach yeah, is funny. Whatever makes you happy. Uh, James or James, what you want to hear? Third eye tie. Funny how the people that don't believe dreams can come true, like yours, never get anywhere in life. Eric says, "Yeah, but I, I guess my whole point of that question is, what the heck is is it better to be blissfully ignorant or to know?" And I, I think in general, if you go down the ignorant bliss thing, you will be happier, but you your life won't matter as much because people's lives matter that actually change the world you know i asked my grandma my grandma's an atheist and when i was little she's always giving me the same answer i used to say grandma what's the purpose of life because my mom was religious believed in god heaven and my grandma didn't at all so i said grandma then what's the purpose of life she said to be remembered you know and so to be remembered the people we remember throughout history life wasn't always happy i mean abraham lincoln was a guy who had tremendous hardships in life, but he mattered. Like it was important he was alive. Um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Jesus Christ, all these people that you see didn't always have perfect lives. Although I was reading about a man in history, his name is something like Mubalik the Bloodthirsty. He was the first real emperor of the Moroccan, in Morocco, Africa. And he had 5,000 concubines, four wives. I thought it was interesting, that ratio. Four wives and 5,000 concubines. And um, he had 900 children. Him and Genghis Khan had the most. Genghis Khan, they think, had 2,000 children. We're all related to Genghis Khan anyway, aren't we? 0.5% like of, uh, a little under 1% of all people are related in the world to Genghis Khan. Mm. And this Mubalak, the bloodthirsty... So, but if you looked at his wives, if you looked at them in the eyes, you got your head chopped off. Isn't that insane? I mean, people think times are tough now. They think there's a lot of unfair inequality in the world, and there is. But, my God, in those times, it was like you're just walking, you look yeah. over to the side, he sees your wife, he's like, off with this damn head. I'm reading a book now by Osho. Jeremy yeah, yeah. put me on to him. And he's saying, forget trying to be remembered. He goes, let go of this idea of trying to be remembered. You'll be dead. It right. doesn't matter. And he's all about like doing what you want to do in the moment and being present and being happy rather than like... Osho is the, is the guru who basically preached free love and had tons of women. You know that? I didn't, but... Oh, I'm, dude. I'm, 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 Osho? A big, I'm a big fan. Osho was like Hugh Hefner. Oh, really? Oh, dude, he was famous. And he he taught it. He was like, 
sleep with everybody. And a lot of, it's always funny yeah. when I talk with people preaching Osho, who are like these like meditative Osho people. I'm like, you do know this was the Indian Hugh Hefner, man. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> he died in 2000, I think. He, he was born, yeah. He has m many names. He, yeah, he was saying also like, uh, here it is. I actually took a photo of it. Um, this, he's essentially saying you can't promise someone that you're going to be married to them forever. Yeah. Like you can't promise someone that I like you're going to love them forever. Of all of the Osho quotes, Zach, <laughs> that James could <laughs> write down, he copies down. I've got it. I'm going to read it here. I got it because I, I took a photo of the thing. He goes, everything that is beautiful, precious is going to be very momentary. But you want everything to be permanent. You love someone and you promise, I will love you my whole life. And you know perfectly well that you cannot be even certain of tomorrow. You are giving a false promise. All that you can say is, I'm in love with you this moment. And I will give my totality to you. About the next moment, I know nothing. How can I promise? You have to forgive me. I like that. Because <laughs> I don't want to stay. I haven't the, seen oh. James this excited in this whole radio podcast <laughs> until he, he's reminding himself. I don't like the idea. Sorry, Zach. I don't like the idea of standing at the altar, Aww. getting married, and promising till death do us part. I think. What'd you for say, me, Kate? Kate's James says, I dear. Oh. Yeah, he has his Australian way of. So I like it. Was it just my accent? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like. I don't like that. I don't. I don't think that I could. Uh, James is like Gene Simmons. I was watching. I've only seen like that his talk show once. I mean his uh, reality show. What was it called, Zach? Family Jewels? No. Was that Ozzy Osbourne's or Gene Simmons? Ozzy Osbourne's was the Osbournes. Yeah, Gene Simmons was Family Jewels. So there's one episode where this guy is getting married and he invites. Uh, um, Gene Simmons just happens to be in Vegas, so. He goes, I'll walk the aisle with you. So while they're walking the aisle, he looks at the guys and he goes, dude, are you sure <laughs> that you love this woman? The guy's like, totally love her. He's like, are you sure you only want to be with this woman forever? Yes. He's like, and he was like shaking the guy like, are you sure? <laughs> <Yeah>. That's James. <laughs> it's like that that scene in, uh, what's the movie with Vince Vaughn and um, where? No, no, not Wedding Crushes. Uh, Vince Vaughn and... No, oh, damn it, I can't remember. But he says the same thing. Like this guy, Will Ferrell's character is about to get married and his bride is walking down the altar and he's like, dude, run now. Yeah, old school. Run That's now. So he's like, dude, get out now. You're, it's going to be one vagina for the rest of your life. <laughs> get out now. And he's like, no, man, no, man. I love her. I love her. He's like, get out now. Get out now. And he ends up marrying the woman and ends up getting a divorce or separated like months later. So We bring James on the show because he's extremely... Romantic. And I am very romantic. I'm just, not, I don't think <laughs> I'm romantic for the rest of, of time. James, <laughs> J no, James, what James is, he's, he says to a woman, I am romantic right now, but tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow. I probably It's won't momentary. Be. It's momentary. And I was like, have you read Osho? <laughs> you know the thing is, the Beatles said, all you need is love, Zach says. But then oh, yeah. they broke yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you the only problem with Eastern philosophy. I do somewhat respect Eastern philosophy, but some people think it's like always correct. It's not really. I mean, part of being a human, going back to making money, is you have to be able to project into the future. That's one of you know that humans have a very unique ability to. Pro it's called projection, not astral projection or anything weird like that. What it means is, I told you, my German Shepherd dogs cannot project into the future they can't go if there's if i leave all the dog food there they can't go if i eat it all now i'll feel a little sick and i'll have none for tomorrow mm -hmm. they just are like osho they just live for now so there is truth and that's what i was trying to say what makes you happy is osho but doesn't necessarily make you survive no and what makes you survive won't make you happy because the dogs then have to go all right, I'll only eat some of the food now because I need some for tomorrow. Well, if you eat, if you take money, if you make a million bucks, right? Somebody's going to try to take it from you. They're gonna, you're going to spend it partying. You have to be able to turn off your brain and project in the future that if I enjoy everything now, I ain't going to have anything tomorrow. And that, believe it or not, that simple concept is almost impossible for most people to do. I think happiness is your subconscious's 
perception of probability of survival. I think your happiness is related to how much you think you, you can survive into the future. It's like why people love having kids, right? Because your genetic line will continue and because you're creating more allies, which will increase your probability of survival. Yeah, but sometimes kids make people unhappy in the moment. Sure, but subconsciously, it gives you happiness because it increases your probability of survival. Because yeah, well, it's like with money. People go, does money make you happy? You know. Well, in as much as that, it increases your probability of survival. Then you think it does. Yes. I think anything that, that your mind thinks, either on a conscious or subconscious level, will make you survive. Yeah. Increases your happiness level. Yeah. Again, humans are not designed to be happy. Humans are designed to survive. It's simple. I think that the, the thing, I mean, happiness, the theory of why, ha why we're happy, it's interesting. So you ask different people, you're going to give your things. Like, what do you think happiness is, Kate, in your opinion? <clears throat> um, what makes you happy? What makes me happy? Besides being on a podcast with me. <laughs> wow. And having guys send you dick pics. <laughs> no, um, she doesn't give out her number. Simple things make me happy, actually. I find happiness in the smallest things. Like, for instance, my bunny. Like, I literally... She has a little bunny called Bun Bun. I love her. I love animals. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to talk closer. I Just little things. I love animals. I love being healthy. I love... Being healthy increases your probability of survival. Does Bun Bun, her rabbit, make her? I like caring for someone or something. I like, like I like that I saved her from an animal shelter. Like she could be stuck in a little cage, and now she has a large. And now she just runs around your apartment, and goes to the bathroom everywhere. No, she's litter trained. Actually, bunnies can be very smart. They're like cats, but uh, she does make a mistake. Zach's a cat. Maybe man. on a maybe on a subconscious level, even though the bunny can't directly help you, maybe the fact that you are helping. I like and to help. I try. It's to. the altruism. Yeah. Kin, kin altruism. I and like then to and know then, that I could help someone. And something. then maybe the fact that you are caring makes you more attractive to either right. the opposite sex or to other people, like platonic friends, which again increases your allies and which again increases your chances of survival. That's called. Yep. That's called. <laughs> altruistic displays that people do that's why people sometimes when they give to charity i give to charity exactly. they tell everyone yeah well yeah i don't do that but jersey, no but jersey the curb enthusiasm where uh larry and ted danson gave to a charity but ted did it anonymously oh he, tell everybody. <laughs> he told him i gave it a, so i was talking about curb your enthusiasm when ted danson Gave anonymously, but then told everybody that he gave anonymously <laughs> to charity. The best thing is if you can give anonymously, but then you leave clues so people discover that yeah. you gave it anonymously. Yeah. But then, you didn't. Yeah. And then you get you all leak the it to the press. So <laughs> they're like, Zach anonymously left yeah. his whole fortune. And then you play it down. Like, yeah. Oh, oh how did this get out? <laughs> That's what people do. You know what people do in Hollywood? Like the Kardashians or, you know, Paris Hilton. What, all these people, what they used to do is they would their publicist would call like TMZ and be like they're having dinner at uh Boa Steakhouse and then the paparazzi would show up and then um <laughs> Paris and Kardashians or it wasn't always the Kardashian but famous people socialites would come out and be like oh I don't want to see the camera but they literally called the cameraman <laughs> yeah. there just to be a little more famous man yeah. somebody said $800 will make you happy Jude Hannah 800 bucks no it's is them they done studies that show that if you can make $70,000 right. your level of happiness is always going to be okay and then from 70 anything above that it goes up a little bit but not as incrementally yeah it doesn't go up dramatically. yeah you need basically here's the thing if you're broke you're unhappy mm -hmm. almost always but if you can you don't have to become a multi-millionaire to be or even a millionaire to be happy you know you you have to but you can't be struggling every moment of the day but what i would i think happiness i do think there's truth to that but a better way to think about happiness is really you your body playing tricks on you that's really what it happened because a hundred yeah. years from now or however old you are, some of you, let's say you're 20 in 60 years, 70 years, the stuff that was super important to you now that gave you either depression or happiness, they, they're pretty much antithetical, right? They're opposites. 
it'll be all irrelevant. You won't even remember that it's not it's not real happiness. So for example, I'll give you an example. People will be like, "Oh, you know, I don't like like when there's girls in Beverly Hills that are like 19 getting boob jobs. They're like, "I don't like my boobs." Well, here's the deal. No matter what you do, by the time you're a 70 year old woman, you're gonna look back and be like, "It didn't matter. It didn't." So what your body is doing is playing tricks on you in order to do a little bit what James is talking about. If a girl looks better, she's more likely to attract a better guy, have more children, so on and so forth. So it's it's your mind. That's why I said in one of the earlier parts of this podcast, in order to go from zero to a million, you have to be able to play tricks back on your brain. Mm. So you're like... People can't read because when they sit down, they don't experience happiness. But just be honest. You know, the best thing I've ever heard of this, of a reprogrammed mind, the best celebrity reprogramming of the brain is the story of The Rock. The actor, Fast and Furious, the second highest paid actor. When he was a young child, he loved his dad. His dad was a pro wrestler, this big, strong guy, and he looked up to him. And when he was five years old... His dad started allowing him to come to the gym, but it was like a privilege. So imagine you're five years old. Your dad's this big, strong guy. And he's like, come on, son, you can come to the gym. So he would go to the gym, but he couldn't lift weights, obviously, at five. It was big, heavy weights. But he said his dad would be lifting and these big, heavy weights. He would hear, you know, the when you do a big, heavy bench press, what is the sound? It goes cling when you put it. And he said that noise to this day releases all kinds of happiness, nostalgic feelings. Mm. Imagine if everybody in America had that understanding, that happiness from going to the gym. Mm. Nobody would be fat. Yes, I get to go and lift weight and yeah, sweat people and be put like, tremendous strain yeah. on my body today. Yes. Yeah, but a lot of people, there's people that feel, guys like Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Kobe Bryant had one of the, in basketball, had one of the greatest work ethics of all time. You look at guys like Ronaldo, the soccer player, these people like that, they enjoy training. Yeah. And so what I do, going back to the concept of business, making money, when I read, I I got lucky because as a little kid, my mom was a single mom, so she brought me down to San Diego where my grandma lived, and my grandma helped raise me. And my grandma's a big reader. And so as a little kid, my grandma would not let me watch TV. And she would, I mean, real young, like one or two years old. She gave me like stacks of books. And she's like, when I was getting potty trained, I used to sit on the, those little, you know, those little toilets they have for potty training. And she has pictures. I would have like 20 books stacked up and I wouldn't get off. She's like, get off. And I would just sit there and read at like a one. I, I started reading at like one and a half or something. And so to this day, when I pick up a book, it's a little bit like how the rock feels. I get a pot, how he feels about the gym. <laughs> no, not Zach. Ignore Zach. But, but I'm saying that's most people's programming about learning is negative. It's, mm. it was take a test for school. You know, it's a bullshit thing. You know what you can do? There's a few little practical things you can do to rewire your thinking around this. If you change your language around an action, then mm -hmm. you can change how you feel about it. For example, oh, I have to get up early in the morning. Right. Right. If you change it from I have to to I want to. Right. Or I'm you, excited to. I'm excited to yeah. or I choose to. Or I get to. Or I get to. It's it, You feel so much better about that. Yeah. Rather than saying like, oh, to go to the gym tomorrow morning at yeah. 6 30 i've got to get up at 6 30 go oh i want to get up tomorrow morning at 6 30 i can't wait to get up tomorrow at 6 30 your whole mindset can change just by changing two little words yeah get rid of get rid of the words i have to and change it to anything else yeah like a positive reinforcement here's the other thing physiology is a huge component in your happiness level right if you're smiling and you're laughing like i am now right there's muscles being activated in my face when I smile, right? My body and my physiology remembers that. So one of the tips I've learned to try and get into a happy mode in the morning is I will literally get a pencil or a pen and I will stick it in my mouth like this, just like this. And what that's doing is it's forcing my 
my face to smile, right? It's yeah. my brain is going, oh, okay, you're smiling. Zach, will you do that and demonstrate for us? No, no, I think you did. <laughs> Come on, Zach. He just did a great job with that. <laughs> <laughs> so it literally, like you can see. Zach's a, a pen pirate. You hold it there, and now your whole face is like taking the Kate, action of a smile. Can you demonstrate that? We need it. Yeah. No, not the same pen. <laughs> <laughs> no, not the same pen, Zach. <laughs> We don't have any other pen. Oh, uh, okay. We, here we go. We got one here. So for the rest of this podcast, Kate, happier? can you be happy? <laughs> no, Kate's already happy enough. Kate does not suffer from happiness, uh, from, uh, from over happiness. Yeah, I I need to actually chill on. Although, laughing. let's see. Let's I kinda see you do it. I laugh at inappropriate times. Everyone wants to see you do it. There you go. Good teeth too. Look at that. <laughs> James sounds like he's <laughs> assessing a horse. Come on, James. That's not a good thing to say to a woman. You have good teeth. That's a good one. The other, the other thing that makes that makes people happy is contrast. So it's right. like remembering a time where you yep. weren't as successful or you didn't have something. That's so, the I would say that I, I actually we went out to eat. How long were we up last night till like um, four a.m. Four a.m. I went with. But uh, we were lost in conversation, so the Tom time Tom by. from MySpace, the guy who founded MySpace, was there. He's a friend of mine, and a guy named Owen Cook was there, and we were just talking late into the night, and <laughs> and I was saying, dude, I, without a doubt, the greatest way to be happy is completely. <laughs> well, hold on one second. This guy said, "Ty, I'd steal your girl, Ty," but he spelled steal. Still, <laughs> Ty, I'd steal your girl. You would steal her. Is that like? So mm, I'm interested. How would you? Your how grammar. would you steal her? Yeah, just curious. <laughs> He's like, what yeah. would you text me? What would you text? Somebody her? said, uh, not if you can't spell steal. Laughing yeah. my ass off. Um, no, I, I, I think that if I could have a superpower around happiness. So there's like, what's the best superpower to become rich? Probably. To fly. To fly? To teleport, actually. I've run the teleport. No, but that's not to become rich. <laughs> Flying ain't going to help you. Um, no, what will make you rich, without a doubt, is learning more. Learning faster. Number two, <laughs> what will make you happier is, without a doubt, being able to contrast to your worst moment and bring that up instantly into your brain. Yeah, for sure. If you can bring up instantly the nightmare that you've been through and you can contrast, that's why I read books. Yeah. I read a horrible book the other day. And I, I try, you shouldn't read, I mean, horrible, it was a horrible story of these people getting kidnapped and just like, mm. and, but it makes you go, oh, shit could be worse. Because mm. a lot of people, if you ask them to describe their problems, they're always like, Oh, well, I'm only making a hundred grand and I, I want my friend makes 150. Well, you're still making a hundred grand. Other people go, Oh, I'm so unhappy. Why? Well, there I'm in traffic in LA. Well, at least you live in LA, which is a cool city that a lot of people want to live in. That's why there's traffic. At least you got two hours. You could be listening, learning a language. So. Right. It, when you people got no, per, I, I said this on my tweet, Twitter. I left a tweet the other day, and it said, "Almost all unhappiness comes from a lack of perspective." Literally. Now there are some legitimate things that will make you unhappy. Like when I read this story of these people were kidnapped by this dude for ten years and locked in a house, right in the middle of Ohio. Ten years they were tortured chained three women were 10 years yeah that's a nightmare so my here's my point that is a truly impossible to be happy basically i mean i'm sure they i don't know the psychology of it but that's a real dilemma as opposed to what most people are pissed off about is like you know you here's the best example of this you get on an airplane and uh what's the guy who talks about this the comedian louis ck and like, God help you if the airplane movies don't work. Yeah. I was on an airplane recently and the movies didn't play. You would have thought that people were in a torture chamber. <laughs> they were like, you know, and, and um, uh, what's his name, Zach? The comedian? Louis C.K. Louis C.K. goes, I was on a flight. Go, I'm not going to say it is funny him, but he said, people going from New York City to Los Angeles. And he said, right when we got on, um, 
Oh, no, he said a friend came from New York to L.A. and was complaining. Lois, you ain't going to believe this. And he's like, what was wrong? He's like, we, they held us on the tarmac for one hour. We couldn't got off the plane. And he goes, uh, did you just travel from Los Angeles, New York to Los Angeles in five hours through in a chair in the sky? He goes, 200 years ago, that used to take six years on a wagon train. Half the people died on the trip. He said, you got to the other side of the country with a whole new group. You had a new wife, new kids, because everybody died. And now people are like, you won't believe this. <laughs> I had to spend five hours, not four. I mean, this is one of the worst. Like, I want to look at people and be like, what are you talking about? And, and I'm, I'm going to give you practical little stories. True story. Super Bowl. What year did we go to the Super Bowl? La it was this year. Last you year. went two years ago when it was the Broncos taking on the uh, Carolina Panthers in San Francisco. It was yeah, a that year one, and the a San Francisco. Ago. We went to the other one too. We went to the I, so two years ago, two Super Bowls ago, we went up there, and as I was coming back, I had to take a separate plane um, back to L.A. And while I'm uh, sitting on the plane, all of a sudden, they go, "The pilots aren't here," and everybody's like, oh. "It was like eleven o'clock, right after the Super Bowl, like eleven thirty. We're trying to get home to L.A." Oh, everybody's mad. Now, I had just bought at least $200 worth of books. So I had this huge stack, and I was the only person on the plane. I was like, damn, now I got time to read them. So I sat there reading, and the other people um, the other people were still complaining. And finally, they're like, the pilots ain't coming. We got to get everybody off the plane, find new pilots, and put it on. So people flipping out. So I walk off the plane, and I'm just reading. I'm like, good, I'm going to finish my book. And there's a guy sitting next to me. And he's this actor that I recognize. If you've ever seen Terminator, he played the... It was a Terminator 2? Yeah, he was the Terminator in the second. He was the bad guy in the Terminator cop. 2, the cop. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, I just struck up a... Con I was like, you know what? Let me use this time. Yeah. Instead of bitching and whining, who cares? I just was at the Super Bowl. Remember, everybody on that plane had just gotten a... They had just gone from a Super Bowl. So they're already having a good day. It's the biggest sporting event You're in America. You're already winning. Yeah, already winning. And we're going to be home. Instead of being up at 1 o'clock, we're going to be back at 2. So I'm there, and I go, you know what? I'm going to talk to him. So I talked to him. We became friends. He's on the, one of the biggest TV shows in America. He's on um, The Scorpion. He's one of the, the main characters. We became friends. I read these books. And then I got home like one hour earlier. I mean, one hour later than normal. But look at all. So... People are lack of perspective yes. is a nightmare. And I'm guilty of it. The human brain has tremendous problems with contrast bias. It's called contrast bias. That's the scientific term. Don't give in to contrast bias. It's a damn nightmare. Yes, Robert Patrick but, is his name. But do give in to it if you're contrasting where you are now compared to a time when you were worse off. Like, yes, but people don't do that that much. No, they don't do it. But I can tell you, I am so guilty of it. Like, f like I only really started getting building businesses like four years ago. Yep. And when I made a million dollars from the, from my businesses that I learned, I was both happy and satisfied and content. Right. Right. Because I knew that I'd got, you know, years earlier, I, I didn't have the ability to do that. But then not soon, uh, sorry, soon afterwards, I started waking up in the morning and the first two or three minutes of my thoughts every morning were, everyone else is crushing it. You're not. Right. You're not selling enough. Your business is, found right. is, is, is just doing okay, but it's not doing amazing. There are 18-year-old kids who are making $2 million in the first six months of their business. Right. You only made $1 million in 11 months of your business. Right. And I, and I could realize the ridiculousness of the thoughts. Like I could perceive, I could see it, that it was just like, mental diarrhea essentially right. but it was so interesting that i could go from you know a month or two earlier going wow i can see how i have my life has changed from a couple of years ago when i couldn't make a million dollars to now but then two months later it was like I'm, I'm i'm nothing compared to all these other people that i'm around so i i was guilty of it and it's so it's like the human brain is so weak. Yeah. How do we succumb to it so easily? What I'm I'm curious as to why that happens. Maybe it's also because I, wait, wait, because you're forgetting the initial 
basic supposition of this whole conversation, which is what makes us survive, which is pushing yeah. yourself to grow your business, yeah. is the unhappiness. See, if you were completely content, com there's there's actually a mental problem that some people have. It's mm -hmm. it's zero neurosis because what you were doing is being neurotic. Mm -hmm. you, neuro neurosis is overreacting to small things. So you were going, I only made a million and other people are making two million. That's a small thing on the grand scale of life threatening things. Very small. But so you were being neurotic and neurotic behavior exists for an evolutionary reason. If you had zero neurosis, you would just never, you'd never try harder again. So you just make a million bucks. Mm. Your business wouldn't progress. So what you have to do is you celebrate to it. But no, because it. You got to toy with it. Yeah. So you want it to be there sometime just enough to push you. And then you want to be able to bring it down. You know what I'm saying? But you got to know that you have to know that it, that it's there. Like you almost have to take a step back and notice that, that you yes. are thinking that you have to be aware. That's why yes. you have to have awareness. Yep. Because if you don't, then you're cooked. Then you just spiral into this like depression or like aggressiveness or whatever. The first thing is being aware of that. Absolutely. By the way, is that the right time? That's how uh, long we've been going, 95. Okay. So we're going to wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. So, yeah, going back, as you notice, everything we're talking about today is the psychology the psychology, the mindset that it will take. And I promise your biggest enemy, it is not hard to make money in the modern world. It is easier than it's ever been. More people are doing it. More millionaires are being created than ever before in history. In just the last couple of years, more billionaires created, more females, more black people, more Ma Mexican people, more Asian people, like of all races, more, more people are rags to riches. Um, and so Western. your biggest Western. issue, Ty, what's up with the Starsky and Hutch haircut? That's what somebody said. I didn't comb my hair very well today. Um, somebody said, does Rome want to go home, Ty? That's your cue. <laughs> you guys notice Rome back there in the background? Are you drinking? What are you drinking? Oh, I Vodka. thought he's back there on my bar. Vodka and his water. I threw all the alcohol away. <laughs> no, Kate Do, doesn't drink. I want to. I want to ask a question, Ty. Are you are you happier because you are physically bigger and have a more muscular and you're fitter than what you were, say, three or four years ago? Does that give you happiness? Do you look at the contrast bias there? Does that give you pleasure or contentment or? Oh, uh, that is a good question. I think. You know, my brain's a little weird on stuff like this. How I perceive. Yes, it is. What are you talking about? <laughs> Just kidding. Kate's even weirder than mine. I'm that a good is a weird. So, Kate, I'm going to show you a photo yeah, of me and Ty. This is the, the the day, the very first day that I met Ty, and we got a photo. I'm going to show you Ty as well. Okay. So have a look. So, Kate, I'm curious if you would you would date this guy. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Don't put him on the spot. Let me there see. You go. Oh, you look awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Dude, you, James, you for that. Than, that to, nothing like people, picture. nothing like people knowing you for a long time to this be the able first day to. I met you. Yeah, but that was not so long ago. But like, I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious. I'm curious, right? Because you, your, your <laughs> physical stature has changed. Has changed. Yeah. dramatically in right. like 12 to 18 months right and like you look at that photo and you go it's changed a lot right you look like a skinny what year little, was that 2013 was that 2013 <laughs> 2013 yeah so i'm curious like we were talking about visualization <laughs> and contrast bias right like right. i know that if if i if i'm down feeling down i want to make myself happy then i'll just look at a screenshot of my bank balance from like three years ago and I'll okay. look at it from today <laughs> or I'll look at a photo of when I wasn't working out and right. I was drinking, um, not excessively, but drinking enough that it was like I was eating crap food or eating poorly and I had like a puffy face and like yeah. a belly and all that stuff. And then I'll look in the mirror or I'll just, you know, realize how I feel and that will give me happiness. Yeah. Everyone wants to see the picture. <laughs> I threw I threw Ty Somebody said that's here. not fair. Show us a, it's not that bad. No, no, it is not here. bad. But there you go. You can show him. Yeah. Ow. <laughs> we just knocked heads. 
Yeah. Somebody said, Ty, you could punch him and no one would blame you. <laughs> That's what somebody <laughs> said. Um, so I'm curious, like I, I, even if you go back and you look at YouTube videos on your channel from like 18 months ago, you're different. You look different. Right. You've got like Girls a like soft, confident. but yeah, but like physically you've got a, like a soft face. You've got like, but you a, know, you know, the difference. Now I'm it's like more, chi it, it seems like more chiseled and hard just because you are working out. Right. But like, you know, I'll tell you with girls, it, here's the thing about girls. Um, I don't know that I necessarily date. Well, I don't know if I necessarily date prettier or better girls that now than there. Oh, whoops. It didn't work. <laughs> She's got a headset. It's fine. So even when you're like looks matter to girls, but I'll tell you, if you have some other things going for you, you could compensate. So if you have some charisma, if you got some stuff, but it is better, like James said, to be in shape. It's, better but it's not as you know what's funny it's better because it increases your chances of survival and <laughs> it, james it, is gonna bring it and, back to it zach and, james has decided on his yes. theory and which is about <laughs> here's the other thing and be, and women it increases their chances of survival right. if they align with a, a man who but there's girls that will like you when you're nerdy guys and there's girl and some girls won't like you this is a funny thing about women and this has been proven over and over scientifically. So they call it niche theory. So basically girls fill niches, even beautiful girls. So what they know, for example, is there's some amazing women out there that won't date very good looking guys because in the past they dated a good looking guy who turned out to be a player and cheated on him. So they decide to fill a niche which is to go after like a shy guy, a quiet guy, a nerdy guy. And mark my words, you look at every supermodel and you ask them to do pictures of the last 10 people that they've dated. Every one of those girls has a meathead dude, big muscle guy. Every girl has a pretty boy in there. Every girl has a rich guy. Every girl has an older guy. You know, and then almost every girl has a nerd. And so a lot of life is just like things shift. There's a saying that I like, one of my favorite things. There's no solutions. There's only trade-offs. So just for all of you wanting to become a millionaire, just remember being a millionaire is no solution. It's a trade-off. Some things will get better and some things will get more annoying. That's true. If you become a better looking guy, some things will. But I promise you, there are some girls who go, well, now I think you're going to, I mean, I've had in relationships I've had, no joke, you even know some of these girls or one of these girls was like, I like the old tie way better. I mean, she's like, dude, I like the nerdy tie. I like that. Blah, blah. I like it. She, nah, but she liked that. What James was showing. She's like, yeah. I didn't like, I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to. And she's like, I don't like big, strong. Dude. Before, she had a dude that was nerdier than me before. And she was pretty. This girl was A-list pretty. So I, I I think it becomes a trade-off. Now you get different pretty girls. But I don't think that it's very hard with humans because of all the niches that humans fill to ever go, okay, if I was just richer. For example, the richest guys I know don't always do the best with women. They're just as lonely. Even, you know, John Mayer. Mm. John Mayer said, he's like, dude, I slept with so many more women when, before I was known. He's like, when I just had a guitar and nobody knew me as John Mayer, because John Mayer is a good looking dude. Mm -hmm. And he can play the guitar like insane. He's not a dude you want to hang out with your girl for a week. <laughs> you don't want to send them on a business trip together, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, dude, now I almost get... No women, because he has to be cautious. Maybe they like him for money. Maybe they're trying to get pregnant. So it becomes, so it's not necessarily a trade-off, you know. I mean, it's not necessarily a solution for him. It's actually just a trade-off. Sure, he probably wouldn't go backwards, but it's not always as good as you think. And that's why I say, you should, if you want to make money, it should be for other reasons besides just pure happiness, because it'll always be a competition. Once you make $10 million, you'll go, uh, I remember and not that long ago, I remember being making about a hundred grand a year and just going, mm, I wonder if I could ever make a million. And I was just like, that's a lot, man. And then 
I figured out how to make a million in a year. And I'm like, I wonder if I could make like three or four million. And then you make that. And then it's like, now I know how to make four million in a month. But, but and you forget now if I make less than four million in a month or something, I'll be all like depressed. I'll be like, oh, everything. So the brain is just playing yeah. tricks and it's and it never really so what you have to do is sometimes be able to step away from the crowd, which the crowd includes your own mind, right? You have to be able to step away from it and just that's where Osho comes into me. Mm. Otherwise, every win is also a loss. Yeah. Michael Jordan, LeBron James, they're like, once I win the NBA, Michael Jordan said once he won an NBA championship, he's like, he was happy for that day. And he woke up the next day and is like, now I got to get two because people will say this one's lucky. Right. And then you get two. And you, but you know what? That made Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, because he had the hyper competitive thing. So I think no matter what your personality is. Okay. Somebody said, T what if a girl who wrote this? Here's a question. Is she 347 says, what if a girl is taller than you? Here's the deal. I've dated some girls taller than me, some shorter than me. Here's the thing. James probably the same. Um, How tall are you, James? Six one and a bit. You'll find some girls that are, guess what? Nicole. Attracted to guys that uh, some girls don't care. Nicole Kidman dated Tom. married Tom Cruise and Keith Urban's shorter than, than than her as well. Oh, that's all the time. Look at Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. He's like 5'2 or something. Kevin Hart's smaller than Maya. Really? Maya's 5'3 wow. and a half and he's like right yeah. Yeah. I would I know Kevin Hart. Personally, so. I don't Small guy, but big personality, right? But his wife, he has a pretty wife, and she's like 5'9". Mm. <laughs> but he, you know what? She thinks he's funny, mm. and he's Kevin Hart, and he's a cool dude, and you know, so it's like you get you got to deal with what you got, and then it's not that. Some things, you, there's that old saying, you, you, you got to know what can be changed and what can't, and you just, what are you going to do? Mm. You know? You you got what you got. Some people go, if I was only smarter, Ty, life would be better, you know, blah, blah, blah. If you always say that. I yeah. mean, I was, yeah. I always, Guys that are six foot are like, if I was only six three. Trust me. It, uh, and then dudes who are tall, you know, I just had a NBA, um, I had a party with the NBA at my house two week, two Saturdays ago. Zach missed it, of course. His good Leo Luck, he got stuck. And I had five of the NBA, the Golden State Warrior champions here. And it was a whole weekend. I played football. They were at my house. Then I played football. I was on Kevin Durant's team. And JaVale McGee was here. And then guys start. Even Rome was small at that party. That was so funny. But I was still huge. <laughs> Rome goes, but I was still bigger than all of them. Tall wise. And it was so funny. The, they, they were complaining, these basketball No, no, no. But I'm saying then guys are like, I'm too tall. How tall were they? Seven one. Javel's like oh seven God, or seven geez. one. Javel is McGee is very Draymond. Draymond's about your height. Is he taller than you? Draymond's like six seven. Yeah, he does. Not nah, what did you say? Yeah, Draymond is a funny how he looks. But so my point is, this shit never gets better. And women too. Women, tall women wish they were shorter. Almost all five eleven girls are like, if I. I'd rather be like five nine. And then it's like I wish it had bigger boobs. Yeah, and bigger girls. Boobs. Then you know it's a funny thing. I went to Finland once. Finland in Finland, near Sweden and Estonia, the most blonde haired women naturally in the world. Finland's known for that. Yeah. So I go to Finland. Every single girl has dyed black hair. Yeah, that's true. With blonde roots. You know how like in yeah. and then in California, girls are brunettes mostly. And they dye it blonde, and the brunette roots are coming out. Right. And I asked the, I asked all these Finnish girls, I'm like, why do you dye your hair? And they're like, Ugh, blonde hair is so boring. And I'm like, in California, people are going, girls are like, oh, everybody's brunette. I want to be the California, yeah. you know, Quinta. Helsinki so, is like yeah. notorious for that. I was in Helsinki yep, for a while. That's week, where I was. Yeah. Crazy. I went salsa dancing in Helsinki. I'll never forget. I had a business disaster. I was, I had a business and, I got a call at like, well, the time is way different, but it was like three in the morning in Helsinki, Finland, which is something like six or seven in the morning in California. 
and I got a call from PayPal and they're like, we're no longer doing, I, was, I own different businesses and one of the businesses are like, we don't want to process for, and it wasn't just my business. They shut off the entire world processing. And I'm like, I process, and you know, I was processing in bank stuff, I don't know, $400,000 a month or something. And they're just like, yeah, you got 10 days and we're shutting it off. Ruined my trip to Helsinki because I had to find other banks and shit. Damn you, PayPal. PayPal's a, I'm going to warn all of you people. Those of you doing business online, your merchant accounts are through PayPal. Watch yourself because PayPal has a history of just being like, nah, we don't really like your business anymore. We're just moving on. Yeah, that I'll never forget that in Helsinki because I looked down at my phone and it was like, miss call because I was downstairs in this salsa place and right in the heart of Helsinki. Helsinki is kind of a weird place, dude. A it's lot like of the pick- twilight zone. A lot of the pickup guys say that it's the best place for, really? for women. Yeah, Helsinki. a lot of those RSD guys are like. They love Helsinki. I went to Estonia. Helsinki. That's a great place. Tallinn, Estonia. Oh, I didn't like Estonia. I liked it a oh, lot. Dude, I went to Estonia. And this girl, this uh, girl I knew was like, if you go to the main town square, you're going to get robbed at night. So I forgot she had told me that. You'll like this story, Zach. I forgot about this story. So I'm in Helsinki, and I there was just a friend. This girl was a friend. She's like, don't go downtown. It's a dangerous place. So I meet this I, this girl that I was like kind of dating who was from Estonia, texts me, and she's like, meet me downtown. And I was so excited to see her. That's why I'd gone to the country. I'm like, sure. So I go downtown, and I'm walking. About halfway through this place, it's kind of shady. And all of a sudden, I'm by myself, don't know the language. It's like 1 in the morning, and I'm like, remembering what this other chick said don't go here she goes i guarantee you you'll get robbed so i'm like here's neuroticism goes up i'm jumpy man i'm like what the? and i go into town square and this this person out of the side of my eye comes is bum rushing me like running at me so i turn around fist back just about to punch and i turn and it was like a flower lady you know, like a lady who's like selling little flowers. I almost knocked this lady. I was like, oh, thank God I didn't hit this girl. And she's just like, flowers? And I'm like, don't be sneaking up on people in this town. And so it's it's a uh, Estonia is a weird. Were you yeah. just there? You were yeah, in Lithuania there, yeah. and Latvia and all yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was started in Helsinki and then I got the ferry across to. Yeah, to you take the, the boat. Yeah, the boat. Then I went to Riga and Latvia. Yeah. And then Vilnius, Lithuania. And then I went to Minsk and Belarus. Oh, you went to Belarus? Yeah, I went to Belarus. Were you going looking for an, a wife, man? You were going on that Eastern European wife tour. The funny thing was, is the, <laughs> the funny thing was, is that my fr- all these friends of mine had said, "Oh, you got to go to Belarus. The women there are so attractive, they're beautiful." I'm like, "All right, I'll go." So I went there. I was so tired from the rest of my trip, and I went out like for two hours. I didn't see any attractive women and I went back to the hotel, went to sleep. Then the next day I booked a flight to go back to the UK, right? So I get on the plane in Minsk and you know when you're walking, you're on the plane and you're kind of looking for your seat and as a guy, a single guy, you're like, please just let me sit next to an attractive girl and I can see this like brunette girl sort of about four or five rows in front of me and there was an empty seat next to her and I think, I think that's my seat. I think that's my seat. (laughs) And it was and I went and sat down next to her Anyway, this girl turned out to be Miss Belarus on her way to the Miss World Championships in Washington, D.C. So I got to sit next to Miss Did you Belarus. get her number? Of course I got a number. I've been Instagramming with her for ever since. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your, what was your DM to her? Well, at the time, it was prob- probably just you know, asking her about the Miss World Championships. That was it. So, you, so basically everything turned out okay for you everything turned out just fine you didn't meet i didn't meet any attractive belarusian women in belarus but i sat next to miss belarus herself on the plane out of minsk you know when i went to um speaking so these are called for those of you who don't know much about geography these are called the baltic countries so estonia latvia lithuania um Belarus, I think maybe is considered Baltic. It's more, that's more former Russian. But, oh, there you go. Um, Let me see. So I oh, got a, I, messed it up. I got a plane. I'm sorry. Our plane stopped in Latvia. James, you'll like this. And so we get off the plane and I'm sitting there 
waiting for my connecting flight. And then they go, all right, it's time to get on the plane. So they put us on a bus. All I go, can I walk to the plane? They're like, nope, it's against regulations. Remember, these are former communist countries. They're all about regulation. So I go, okay, we sit on a bus. And we had to wait. There was like a lady in the wheelchair. They had to lift up the wheelchair, put it on the bus. We waited about 30 minutes. Bus turns on. I'm like, finally, we're going to our plane. I'm imagining the plane is way across the airport. The dude, I kid you not, went 18 inches, or no more than three feet with the bus, stopped and let us out. And they go, it's illegal for you not to take a bus. The plane, it was the plane next to the damn door. It was like nine feet away. And they're like, it's regulations. I was like, dude, you would not. Communist countries, I don't know what you guys think about politics, but Name a communist country that you would want to live in in any time in the last 100 years. I mean, oh, man. those countries, Vietnam, have- maybe Bhutan or something. I think Bhutan. I can't remember if it was communist, but there's like nine people in the whole country. But that whole Baltic area, they just get smashed whenever there's a war. Like, yeah. So they got so the, the Nazis yep. took them over in World War II, yep. right? And occupied them. And then the Soviets occupied them right after world war ii yep and basically ru- ruled them so it, it they're stuck between a rock and a hard place right because you got the you got the soviets what was the soviets and the now yep. the russians to the east and the germans to the yep to the west and they just got there's no way out like you just get poland got, all you polish people boy poland got hit the hardest because poland yeah poland has no natural barrier so it's this big flat plane and the germans and russians just fight yeah. And just decimate the Polish people. So, yeah, for those of you traveling, another way, zero to $100 million or $1 million. I keep saying $100 million, but zero to $1 million, <laughs> Travel. Get into a capitalist country. <laughs> yeah, but you know there's a lot of rich people. Somebody said the USSR rules. Um, well, we know someone in Lithuania who's doing all right. Yeah, there, you know, I, we have a guy who used to be in one of my... I think he might be in my one of my mastermind programs now. A guy named Matt Posius, and he's in Lithuania, and he's he does he travels a little bit, but he probably makes hundred grand a month a year a month. No, a month, month. Yeah, he yeah, probably yeah. makes a million bucks a year starting when he was he was nineteen when I started. He's probably about twenty three now. Yeah, he made his first million when he was seventeen. Yeah, I think. he made a million bucks yeah. by to. And but he lives. I just spoke at his event. Yeah, he, he lives just outside of Vilnius, or yep. he lives in Vilnius rather. Yeah, he's engaged now to one. Of I know he other he he, he he got married to a girl he met through me. Engaged. He hasn't he's engaged. Not married yet. Yeah. She's older than him, isn't she? Quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, like ten years older. I don't know, 10 years. You know, statistically, if the woman is one day older than the man, disaster. it doubles the chance of divorce. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Women have to respect men, and men are so immature that if men are about the same age and women are like, this dude's a joke. And you know that, by the way, that's not a feminist or I'm sorry, that's not a patriarchal social construct like some people think. Um, Dr. David Buss did a study of about 100 cultures. And that's the one thing that holds constant in even in Sweden, which is one of the most feminist countries from Sweden to Korea to Vietnam to the the Ashe tribe in South America. Women always date older guys for the most part, except the French president. Yes, he's 49 and she's 60 something or other. Yes, that is interesting. That is an unusual French. Forget the French. (laughs) <laughs> the French are bizarre. Oh, they have good food. They got good food. Beautiful women. French guys are a little suspect in my... I know that sounds horrible. I always rail on the French guys. They're annoying as shit in my opinion. But, uh, so you're not going to be dating a 40-something woman anytime soon? 60-year-old. I'm going to go in for 60. <laughs> Kate, you're out. Bring me the 60... 60- <laughs> Bring me your grandma. <laughs> Find me someone who's 40 <laughs> years older than you. <laughs> All right. We got a minute 15. We're giving this away. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. Whoever answers this gets it. We'll pick something. Um, mm, 
question. Going back to the beginning of the podcast, what is the number one mental attribute you need if you want to go from zero to a million dollars according to the scientific study that I quoted? The number one trait that you need. The winner gets an iPhone 7. I said it in the beginning of the podcast. If you've been here since the beginning, I'm rewarding you for being here. What trait is it? Is it awareness? Is it, you know, being smart? What is the number one trait? Perseverance? No. There you go. Michael Robitin. Congratulations on Facebook proactivity. We'll be sending this out. Give us three or four days to get it to you. Thanks so much for being here on the podcast. I hope you go from zero to a million, not just in money, but in all areas of life. So talk to you guys soon.